Dr. Norm, you are the perfect person for this topic because you are credited as the one who coined the term seasonal affective disorder or SAD. You pioneered light therapy and you've been studying this for 40 years. Can you actually walk us through your origin story and how you first assembled the elements of SAD in the early 1980s? Well, I am originally South African. And as a lot of people know about South Africa, it's a sunny place and you don't have the kind of tempestuous seasonal changes that you experience here in the Northern United States. I got my MD degree back in Johannesburg and then I came to do my psych residency at Columbia in, in New York City. And the seasonal changes hit me personally and dramatically. Uh, I came in the long summer days and I was giddy with energy and enthusiasm. And then the daylight savings time change came. And the first afternoon that I was hit by the darkness so early and I felt the wind blowing off the Hudson. I thought, my God, what's going on here? What am I experiencing? But I hunkered down, as people have learned to do who live uh, at the extremes, and got through the winter, even though it was just surviving. It wasn't really flourishing until the spring, in which case I felt more energetic again. And I sort of thought, what was I making such a fuss about? The winter wasn't so bad. And I went through that for three seasons until I came to the National Institute of Mental Health, the NIMH, to study mood disorders. And very early on, I encountered a gentleman. He was a scientist who had recognized seasonal changes in himself that were even worse than those that I experienced. And working with colleagues, we uh, uh, hypothesized that this was the light that was driving these seasonal rhythms. And so we extended his day with bright artificial light. It's been shortened to BLT, bright light therapy, and found that this brought him out of his depression. And I thought, wow, you know, um, that's really something special. And then I re remembered that I myself had suffered quite badly. And I encountered a couple of other people and I thought, wow, you know, I wonder if this is a generalized phenomenon and if we could characterize it and impact on it. And that's essentially what we did. We spoke with a local journalist, told her, I told her my hypothesis that this, that this seasonal depression was a thing, as they say these days. They didn't used to say yeah. that back then. Yeah. They used to say it was an entity. Now we say it's a thing. So it's yeah, probably a more user-friendly term. And that we needed to understand it. We needed to help people with it. And she was sporting enough to write an article on this as yet unknown phenomenon in the Washington Post that got syndicated across the country. And... I received thousands of letters in response to this article. Well, there was no internet at the time. People actually wrote letters. And um, it was clear to me that we had a consistent syndrome here. We sent them out questionnaires. Many of them responded. And we drew a picture of what the syndrome is like. And I can tell you more about that. But then we brought them in in the summer when they were all well and waited for them to develop what they predicted would be their winter depression. And one of my colleagues says, what happens if they don't get depressed? Won't you look like a fool? I said, you know, that's not the worst thing to look like a fool, um, but it is really worth watching. And sure enough, most of them did, in fact, become depressed. And we put them through the first control study using bright light versus dim light. And that got written up. And that was our original 1984 paper on seasonal affective disorder, SAD, and its preliminary response to bright light therapy. 
So wow. that's the origin story. I appreciate you sharing that because it takes us back in time. I can get a sense of, you know, just that uh, entrepreneurial kind of feeling and spirit that you must have had when you had this idea, you're taking it out to a journalist, the journalist has her energy and her desire to actually go through with it. It's like, you had to like place this brick by brick by brick for it to, for this story to come out to more people so that they can relate. And then you can actually go through with these studies. I just feel like relative today's day and age where things happen quickly, I can kind of tell and hear in the story there was a lot of work that took place, but ultimately you got to the point uh, that we're at today. And you mentioned BLT. I'm sure a couple of people are, are hungry thinking about sandwiches, but you're really referring to bright light therapy. You also mentioned um, dim, you know, dim lights. So just for clarification pur purposes, when you're talking about bright light therapy, what exactly are you talking about? You're talking about LED lights. Well, what has been done since those original days is that industry has come on board and has created these therapy lights that are made to the specifications that we have found in randomized controlled studies to be effective. So what are these therapy lights? They are uh, usually on some kind of stand They'll be like a square or rectangle, at least one foot square uh, with a front, which would be um, a diffusing screen, which filters out the UV light. You know, the ultraviolet light is not good for the eyes. And behind that UV screen are maybe used to be um, three or four fluorescent lights, but they, they are being replaced now by LEDs. Uh, which are mimicking that same kind of light spectrum that the lights in the studies emitted. So um, I would really recommend that anybody listening who thinks they might need such a light, order a light from a reputable company that puts out a goodly amount of light, preferably one that's been used in clinical trials, and that conforms to the specs that I've just said. In fact, in my book, there are two separate chapters that describe the kind of light, how you, how you use the light, what are the features that you're interested in. And then one of the chapters is all about Q&A, the kind of questions that I've most commonly had given to me and the answers that I usually give. So I want anybody who thinks they may have this problem to be able to get what is really a thin book. I had deliberately written a book much thinner than the books of the past. And the book here that I've written, my old book was called Winter Blues. It was a blue cover, dark blue cover, winter blues. It was like the real monograph that really told you. But the new one is lean and mean. It's yeah. called Defeating Sad. It's got a kind of a proactive, a proactive feel to it. And if I may read the the opening epigraph, that's that little quote at the top of the chapter. Yeah, go for it. By the way, this by... book is expected to come out uh, middle of August. Yes. I wanted it to be just so that people could get it and prepare for the winter, that Perfect. they wouldn't be stuck in the middle of their winter depression and then have to scramble. Here comes Albert Camus, the great French Nobel Prize winning author, and here's what he has to say. In the midst of winter, I found there was within me an invisible summer. And that makes me happy, for it says that no matter how hard the world pushes against me, within me there's something stronger, something better, pushing right back. And that's the spirit in which I wrote the book, that yes, we might feel down in the winter, we might feel down in general, but within us there's something that pushes back and that can combat and often conquer this down feeling. I love it. And I really did 
enjoy reading your book. And one of the reasons I wanted to read it and wanted to meet you was first to get a better understanding of how to manage symptoms uh, related to SAD. Your book did an excellent job of doing that. And I can tell that one of the primary reasons you wanted it out in the world is that you've done 40 plus years of work. Now it's time for folks to just have an easily digestible resource where they can find a way to feel more happy regardless of if it's winter, summer, fall, or spring. Um, but also through this book and exercise, I feel like it's an opportunity to develop more empathy because I feel like I can have a better understanding of the person who's in front of me. And maybe they are going through something with their mood that's related to the season. And it's a reminder that the spectrum of humans is really big. And literally, it feels like every type of human exists. So a lot of folks, myself included, I feel like I go through those phases in winter where I feel down, my, my energy is low, I might struggle in social interactions. And then I feel like as spring and summer comes around, I personally start to feel excited and better about myself. But what's really important is to understand that a, a person that you're talking to may be experiencing something different where they actually are impacted by the summer. There's a reverse sad, which you allude to, and we can talk about, but it's just one of those things where I thought it was important to read this so I can understand symptoms, how to manage them, but also how to better relate to people. Absolutely. I mean, you've summed it up. Um, often I'll see couples where they are discordant for whether they have sad. The one has sad and the other one has no problem at all. And it's very easy for somebody who has no biological response to the winter that he or she can perceive, say to the spouse, you know, I get up. I don't like gray days any more than you do, but I get up and I go about my work and what's the matter with you? They may not say it, but that's the implication. And the description of the syndrome, the putting it in a medical context, the explanation, the connection with hibernating animals and animals with seasonal rhythms, all of this, I hope, will destigmatize and also, as you point out, sensitize the non-seasonable, the non-seasonal partner or spouse to be a little more empathic, say, okay. Um, you know, I know this is a hard time of the year for you. Is there anything I can do to make it easier or something like that? Um, and then if you're a good SAD person, seasonal person, you will make it up to your partner when you're feeling better. Hey, mm -hmm. can I cook you a special dinner? You were so nice to me when I was down and out, whatever, you know, just right. a silly example. No, it's a, it's a powerful one, though. Uh, it's a simple and powerful one. And what was surprising was that SAD predominantly affects women. One in four folks who are affected by SAD are women. Can you shine light on the specific reason that um, is causing this difference in gender and potentially if this changes over time as we get older? Yes, just a, a small corrective. It's really three in four that are women and one oh. in four that are men. So 75% oh, wow. of people are women. And um, yeah, that makes sense. Know, what I was I saying before? I, I don't, my math doesn't make sense. Up. I try you to just, avoid math in public. <laughs> it's all right. That's fine. It gives us a chance to, to emphasize the point. Um, I think that seasonality as a syndrome or seasonality as a biological response in nature often coordinates in such a way that the young are born in the spring when there's food around and when the weather is pleasant. And I think it's within the female biology to do this kind of coordination um, and ensure that the young are born at the best possible time of year for survival. And so I think as we evolve through 
different species, I think humans have been the same because remember that there were many, many years when we didn't have central heating, when we didn't have round the year food supplies. And women needed to be able to carry their young, feed their young, conserve their energy. And maybe that was more important for women. And in terms of the hunter gatherers, the hunters were out hunting, the gatherers were at home with the infants. And maybe that's why the evolution worked in such a way as to favor seasonality in women. That's fascinating. That's a perspective I personally have never thought about. But looking back, um, I'm going to do some more research on that because I think that's very interesting in terms of the seasonality and when babies are born and what role nature really had to play in that. Um, but sticking on sad, you mentioned your first book was winter blues. Can we talk about the difference between winter blues and seasonal affective disorder and maybe some of the variations? Well, the conditions? Sure. Um, when we talk about winter blues these days, we're talking about a lesser form of winter problem than sad. That's why, even though this is defeating sad, the book title, I also do a lot of discussion of the winter blues. So let's let's talk about if I had sad or if I had the winter blues, what would the difference be? Well, mostly it's a difference of severity. If I had a real rip-roaring case of sad, I would have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning. I would drag my way through the day. My work would suffer. My boss would say, what's the matter with him? Uh, I wouldn't return. I wouldn't get deliverables in on time, uh, etc. I would overeat. I would gain weight. I would sleep too much. Uh, I would be bad company. Friends wouldn't want to visit me because they would say I was miserable to be around. Uh, I would lose maybe a love relationship uh, through the winter. And clearly, this is a really bad cluster of symptoms that I would have. And I could be quite depressed. I could be dysfunctional. Okay, that's a bad case of sad. You, the listener, do not need to have it that bad in order to seek out treatment, either by reading the book or by other means. Um, it doesn't have to get that bad, but I've dramatized it by really showing you what a bad case would look like. All right, now let's say I've got the winter blues. Well, let's say I'm here on your show and I'm not enjoying myself, which in fact I am. <laughs> but let's say that I, I had the winter blues in a bad form. I wouldn't be talking as within such enthusiasm. I would be struggling to get through. I would have a cup of coffee in my hand to kind of keep me going. Um, people would hear me as being sad and down, or it wouldn't be, I wouldn't be as creative if I was writing something. The prose wouldn't be interesting and different and it wouldn't sparkle. It would kind of lumber along until I got my quote of words out, and it would be a struggle. So um, I wouldn't be looking like I was really depressed, but I wouldn't be the life and soul of the party either. So it would be some lesser form of seasonal problem that really deserves to be taken care of, but doesn't disable me like the more major element that I described before. Yeah, no, I appreciate you walking us through that. And in those comments, you know, you were mentioning winter, uh, obviously. And I find it very interesting that if you think about the end of the year for millions of people, the end of the year is associated with holidays, potentially time with family and friends. But if you take this topic in context, the reality is during one of the most chaotic and hectic times of the year, when you think about you know, Thanksgiving and even going to Halloween, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, all the holidays in between. There are a lot of people that are doing their best with what it is they have, and they might be feeling these symptoms. And 
I just find that time of year very interesting in the context of this subject and that we can be a little bit more graceful with each other, uh, considering that the person that you're interacting with during that time is potentially uh, suffering some sort of um, symptom, whether it's the extreme or even just a sliver of it. I think that's such an important point that, you know, when, when we see somebody who's depressed, they may not seem very interested in us. They may not seem very nice because they're suffering. Right. And, um, you know, people who don't feel nice effort to be nice. It takes an effort to be interested in somebody else's situation. And if you're really down and out, if you're miserable, it's very hard to be generous, to be happy, to be engaged with somebody else. It's just a struggle. And that's all part of the winter blues, sad cluster. So where in the winter months do you think, from all your studies, all the people that you've interacted with, where in that winter time frame does it feel like is really the peak months for when people are being affected? Is it November, December? Is it January, February? Do you have any insight there? Yes, it's January, February, because even though the days are getting longer, the cloud cover is worse in January and February, at least you know, up here in the in the um, mid-Atlantic or in the northern and the England uh, areas, that would be the worst. What it's like for you in San Diego is um, much less severe. However, I have visited San Diego in the winter time in the hopes that I would be just fine because it's much more sunny there. But it so happens that it is not that far south. And, and in fact, if you've got a real good going case of sad, like I do, San Diego is not far enough. You will not get that kind of really healing feeling. You've got to go right down to the bottom of Florida or the Caribbean, and then you will really feel that healing power of the sun, but not quite in San Diego, at least for me. For other people who where it's very mild, that's probably good enough. But it is interesting how every one of us is different and how our needs differ. But the good news is that no matter where you are and no matter how bad it is, you can do all the things that are outlined in my book to feel good all year round. And we'll, we'll go into that because you mentioned light therapy uh, is one avenue that folks can, uh, you know, explore in terms of a way to get better. There's other kind of cognitive behavioral types of remedies as well. I'm sure diet, exercise plays into it as well. Um, I, I try to refrain from talking about medications, but I know in your book, you mentioned that some people need to take medications for this. Um, so... We can talk about that a little bit more, but just one quick question on just generally speaking, how early have you detected SAD in a person? Well, I had one person who came to me in the middle of August, just when this book is supposed to be launching. He came to me in maybe the middle of August, and he was already experiencing the symptoms of SAD. And he had diagnosed himself as sad, but he had not responded to light therapy. And he wondered why. So I thought to myself, well, maybe there's something about him getting those symptoms so early that is related to him not responding to light. So I calculated that the longest day of the year, which is pretty much where we are right today, right. Um, namely the end of June, the longest day of the year. Um, if you take that to the middle of August, longest day of June, the, the third week of June to the middle of August, that was about three-week loss of light. Now, because the weather is nice and bright, we don't really feel it, most of us. But for some reason, biologically, 
that early, early morning time was crucially sensitive to this gentleman. And so I thought, well, let's take the light and put it right at that time, whenever it was, maybe 5.30 in the morning or whenever the sun was rising. Let's give him his light therapy right then. Wake him up early, give him his light therapy. And sure enough, out he came. So, you know, we're all so different. Everybody is uh, unique in some way or another. And he was unique, at least in my experience in having symptoms so early and being so sensitive to light at that time of the day. Yeah, that is really interesting. Um, I'm also thinking through this conversation, how much of this is learned behavior? Because if I'm a young child and I see my parents or parent, um, if I'm lucky enough to have both parents around parents, um, if I see them kind of go through these mood changes around certain times of year, will I be more inclined to follow their suit? Is it is it a learned behavior? Is there genetics involved? Or is it literally like every single person comes out of the box different and you simply never know until they either seek treatment or search for answers? In my experience, at least with this particular condition, it is biological. I mean, but don't get me wrong. It's not like there are not other important influences. For example, I say that if you think of the causes of SAD or the winter blues, think of a three-legged stool, that there are three legs. There's the biology, the genetic, there's the genetics, there's the light, and there's stress. So I've seen people, maybe a nurse who works through the winter until she's maybe 60, 65 years old, depressed every winter, and then she retires. Now, all of a sudden, she can sleep in on a winter day. She can go walking early in the morning instead of rushing through the traffic to get to work. And so reducing stress can be a powerful healing property. And I encourage that. Or you could give more light, or you could do both. The one thing we can't really change, at least yet, is the biology. Mm. But down the line, we may be able to change the genetics, have people feel good all year round, but we may actually lose something because seasonal people are very creative. Mm. And, you know, they may be down in the winter and they may be slowed down but they may also be mulling over some kind of creative idea that they're just dying to do, but they haven't got the energy, but they're they're kind of cogitating it. And they're um, it's like an embryo growing inside them. And come the spring, that kind of gets loosened, you know, and they're able to be wildly creative. And sometimes the spring is actually a difficult transition, but sometimes it's a time of great creativity into the summer um, that's been nurtured and germinating during the winter. You know, one of the interesting components of your book, you mentioned spring, was how studies show that there is a pretty significant increase in the number of suicides that take place in spring. Can you shine light on why that may be? If someone is really depressed in the winter, is it the case that they simply don't have the energy to move through with the decision that's on their mind? You mentioned from a creative perspective where they might be sitting on an idea, thinking of thinking through it, thinking about it, but they don't really have that energy or that catalyst to go through with it. But then spring comes and they can like launch their idea. On the flip side, is it true that folks who are thinking about suicide in the winter end up taking that action out in the spring? Well, I can say that the slowing down of people with SAD in the winter is kind of protective. Um, and um, you see it at the beginning of the wasteland. April is the cruelest month mixing memory with desire, you know, bringing lilacs out of, breeding lilacs out of the dead land. Um, 
as the poet says, how we were comforted by the layers of snow, you know, the, the sort of slowness and um, inertia that comes with winter. And then comes spring, and suddenly there's a rapid expansion of the light. And so for people who can't really make that transition, you know, mixing memory with desire, the thing that pulls you forward, desire, but the thing that holds you back, it's the tension that comes with an agitated but depressed person uh, who now constitutes a greater danger for suicide than somebody who is um, very slowed down, very stagnant. Uh, and I do give a couple of examples in my book of people who have strongly contemplated, even attempted, begun to attempt suicide, but then backed off of it because they just didn't feel they had enough oomph to make right. it happen. Wow. It's really remarkable. I mean, there's so much nuance and again, just in terms of connecting to each other and feeling like we should be giving each other more grace. I mean, these are just more examples of why that's so important. Um, I, I would say one other really important or interesting thing I learned was about air ionization. I did not know this, but energy from winds such as the Santa Ana the Chinook in the Rockies or the Fern in Western Europe have positive ions, which actually lead to negative motions. And on the other hand, negative ions, which are found in the air near fast moving water, think waves and waterfalls are associated with good feelings. And so I really find that interesting because it gives the phrase that there's something in the air, some, some real different context. Um, but again, this is one of those, examples of another element that could be affecting somebody and that is the ions in our air which i find fascinating can you expand on that a little bit yes well you know the existence of these charged particles is not known to many people but in fact is just as you say that uh, sometimes these these very hot dry winds really bring out the you know, the dramatic elements of what these charged particles can do. And I love a quote that comes right out of the, the thriller writer, uh, Raymond Chandler, that I put right at the beginning of the chapter on the positive ions. And he says here, there was a desert wind blowing that night. It was one of those hot, dry Santa Anas that come down through the mountain passes and curl your hair and make your nerves jump and your skin itch. On nights like that, every booze party ends in a fight. Meek little wives feel the edge of the carving knife and study the backs of their husbands' necks. Yeah. Yeah. So... Really just the ions in the air can make you feel like you're going crazy and you have to do something radical. And by the same token, when you're by a waterfall or when you're by the surf, you can feel very calm, you can feel very chill. And so it's interesting to think of all the different environmental influences that can affect the way we feel. Yeah. And it goes back to a comment you made earlier around how the reduction in stress, you mentioned the 65-year-old who had been working as a nurse, and then she retired and was able to sleep in. Just having a reduction in stress can have a positive or can have a really material impact. And so if you go towards you know, the ocean and you watch the waves, or if you look at water flow, uh, waterfalls, typically there's a sense of relaxation that comes from there. There's a reduction in stress, and it's somewhat uh, related and tied together. So we've been talking about winter blues, sad, really predominantly from the winter perspective. We've kind of touched on the spring fever, but what percentage of people would you say uh, suffer from reverse sad, which is the summertime sadness? Well, you know, I think when we have statistics, we bias them against the summer because so much study has been done of the winter kind. And, you know, if you don't look for something, you won't find it. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Uh, but we did find a lot of summer sad, even though we weren't looking for it. And um, I would say that right now, four to one winter to summer, or even more winter to summer. But there are a lot of people that have a hard time with summer, and it's going to get worse because the world is getting hotter. And um, so, you know, whether it's the heat or whether it's the light or a combination that make them feel both lethargic and activated in a bad way, they have this kind of mixed depression, agitation feeling that's so dangerous. And in fact, if you ask them about suicidal ideas, they will endorse them more than the winter kind. Wow. So um, it, is a, a, it is a syndrome. It is something to be concerned about and to anticipate. If you know that it's coming, you can do things that will preempt it. So on that point, right? So from the winter perspective, you want to surround yourself with more light and set up your environment that way. Obviously, you know, table stakes are reduction in stress, good diet, and balance across the board. That's table stakes. But from the winter perspective, you want to have more light therapy. From the summer perspective or the spring fever perspective, are you suggesting folks, you know, create areas in their house that are more, more less prone to the light? I mean, what exactly can someone do at home? I think it varies. And I think people are going to need to do a little bit of experimentation, trial and error. Turn your thermostat down if you can afford it. Um, close curtains, uh, put fans on, have a cool bath or a cool shower uh, or go for a swim. Uh, some people who are lucky enough to be able to travel north can swim in the pools of water that are nice and cool, the Finger Lakes and other places. Um, but I think, yes, keeping cool is one thing. Cutting or cutting down the light may be helpful. I've heard people with summer sad say, you know, the light kind of cuts right through me. Mm. And uh, I do better if I have dark glasses. So that can be helpful. Um, and then, of course, there are medications. And the good thing about when you know when a depression is going to hit is you can preempt it. Start somebody on a medicine you know has been helpful in the past. Start them maybe in March or April in anticipation of June or July being worse. And then just carry them through the summer and then you can taper the medicine on the other end. So I'm not one for saying I go for this but not for that. I'm an eclectic. I like to use whatever is going to help my patient. I'm I'm in it for helping people, not for proving a point. Yeah. And combining different ways. Um, yes. Combining the is the, as I say, combining is the most important word in the book. It definitely is. Yeah. And I'm also interested in, in watching, I, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but being able to track over the next 10 years, if we can get some data on is it true that as the planet continues to get warmer, we are seeing more people, you know, with summertime sad? I, I'm really interested in seeing how the impact of climate change, you know, plays itself out from this perspective. Yes. And, you know, climate change doesn't only affect directly through mood, but if the land is dried, then the trees don't bear as much fruit or the wheat doesn't grow takes away people's food supplies, takes away people's crops, which is maybe their subsistence. It doesn't give them enough water and so on and so forth. So there are many, many ways that the heating of the earth is going to upset the ecology of people's lives. And we didn't really touch on this, like, but if we go down a little bit more of the science path, are you able to tell us a little bit about what actually is happening in our brain or in our bloodstream that's causing these symptoms? I mean, I might have missed it, but I'd be curious, like, what is the science behind this? Whether it's winter, wintertime sad, spring fever, or summertime, I would be very curious about what's actually happening in the brain and in my blood. Well, I think that 
But what happens in the brain must be different from this in the summer people versus the winter people. And we know the most about the winter people. And I do have a chapter in the book on the science of sad and the theories that we have advanced and others have advanced. For example, some of the studies show that people with sad don't process light as well. Their, light, their eyes are not as sensitive. So maybe they are, in fact, not getting as much light from a biological point of view. They may be seeing everything fine, but when it comes to the biology of their light processing, they may not be getting enough. That's wow. why they may need more. And then there's the hormone melatonin that has been so important um, in seasonal rhythms in animals that may be transducing this effect of, of the winter darkness um, and so on and so forth. We know some places in the brain where light registers, where light has an effect on people's energy and mood. And we know some of the neurotransmitters, those little brain chemicals that pass messages from one nerve cell to another that look like they may be not working correctly in the brains of people with SAD. And we've done a lot of studies on it. One of those neurotransmitters is called serotonin. And um, that's been found to be very seasonal in humans. And uh, also it is one of the neurotransmitters that classical antidepressants like Prozac and Zoloft influence. So mm -hmm. a lot of lines of research converge in terms of light, the brain, the eye, melatonin, and these neurotransmitters. And wow. I try to explain it all in the book. Yeah. I mean, again, it's one of those moments where you just pinch yourself and it's amazing to be alive in this body with this system. There's so much nuance. It, well, I tend to take it for granted. Um, and the fact that somebody could be looking, we could be at the beach, you and I, or me and another person, we could be looking at the beach and literally the light is hitting our eyes differently. That to me is really fascinating. And again, another example of we're all different, but at the same time, it's one of those, we need to just give each other a little bit more grace because we really truly may never understand exactly what another person is going through. And so yeah. Um, I do think it's worth connecting the dots on how seasonal affective disorder can have a significant impact on humanity, both at an individual and a societal level. Um, I've, we've talked about this. You've given great examples just in terms of understanding the effects that it might have on mental health, well-being, and just the overall human experience. And so I was kind of thinking about this from different layers, and maybe you can answer some of these questions, but how do you think employers and organizations could implement more supportive measures to accommodate the needs of those who are truly affected by SAD? And putting in this in context of, if you consider seasonal productivity, SAD can lead to decreased productivity, absenteeism, impaired functioning. You alluded to it very early in our conversation. Um, so how can a company or an employer really accommodate those needs for a person do you have any thoughts on that one very simple possibility is just to offer them an extra light oh wow say, you know, so this simple. is a seasonal this is a seasonal um time of darkness and uh we we will loan our uh people lights while they're coming into work so that you don't have to be deprived of light and and you they will be more productive just like you have a coffee machine or whatever, you realize that this makes people more sociable, it makes people more productive. You know, for a one-time cost of $200, you could make a person much more productive and happy and feel taken care of. You know, somebody could, you know, come in after a week. How have you found it? Do you like it? Uh, do you want one of our experts to um, give you an opinion about it or to come and check it out for you. Or it could be just helping people feel a little more cared about and, in fact, giving them something concrete that could make a difference. Very simple idea. Very simple. That's uh, very powerful, too, in the context of 
the mental health crisis as well, where a lot of employers and organizations are trying to be more accommodative for the fact that millions of people suffer from some variety of a mental health disorder. SAD contributes to that list, by the way. Um, and so I think recognizing how prevalent it is, understanding its impact on people and the and the ripple effect of that, I think, can help us continue to prioritize mental health. And uh, it's, a, to your point, a step that an organization can easily take um, to make that person feel like they're being heard and they're being included and they're part of the team. Um, connecting more dots. Uh, again, this is, I guess, some of the stuff I do when I'm bored. No, I'm just kidding. It's in preparation for this. Um, it, you know, I was thinking about it from the social perspective where, and we talked about this earlier, but basically if somebody is affected by this, well, it's going to impact the relationships. It's going to impact the social interaction. Maybe that person doesn't have the same type of mood. Maybe they're withdrawing from the scene. But knowing this gives us a better awareness so that we can actually be more compassionate and be more understanding in that interpersonal relationship and therefore actually be able to support a person uh, if they're having a challenging time. Um, so uh, there's a lot that we can do individually uh, from a society perspective. And I'm not saying that everyone needs to carry the burden of taking care of someone else. But I think many, many times we find each other, we find ourselves in these micro daily moments where we have to act as a coach or a mentor or a therapist at times. And so if we can understand the art and craft of having caring conversations, I feel like that's a benefit for all. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that um, a lot of times people who are struggling are being judged or criticized or getting poor performance reviews. And I think people, the industry is doing better to try to support people. And part of supporting people is not only helping them to feel understood and um, encouraged, but they'll perform better. Yeah, they feel cared about and they feel like if you've given somebody a light box that somebody really understands and cares and wants you to not only produce well, of course, that goes without saying, but also have a better experience. Yeah, exactly. So knowing the light box exists, knowing mm -hmm. that there are different types of therapy that a person can go through, knowing that there are Ion generators, you know, we talked about the ions in the air, you can actually get an ion generator and combine that with the type of therapy, just knowing these things exist, actually, is also important, because it gives people access to these resources. So if someone is struggling, they know they can now, you know, look into these types of therapies or remedies to their problems. And then also, it gives a person who's listening, who feels like they may not have any symptoms, the power to know what they might be able to recommend in a conversation. If someone is showing symptoms or someone does, you know, become vulnerable enough to open up to the person and say, hey, they're really struggling with the seasonal change. Well, that person who might be listening and knows about light therapy and ion generators and cognitive behavioral therapy, they can now recommend these avenues and paths forward to people as well. Um, I think the last thread I was trying to connect relates to knowing that this affects millions of people, which, in my opinion, should encourage cross-cultural research and dialogue and sharing of best ideas and best practices, which, in an ideal world, could be a way to have more diverse thinking and new ideas enter the space. What are your thoughts on if there's enough cross-cultural dialogue happening with this uh, seasonal affective disorder? Well, I think it's a really interesting question. I think we don't know. Like in the middle of Africa, there's probably very little seasonal affective disorder. Right. On the other hand, in India, in the monsoon weather, where there is, uh, you, you know, the wet season and the clouds are covering the sky, there's probably a lot of that problem. But I did want not to leave out the fact that this book, Defeating Sad, is a very practical book. 
I have been very specific to recommend certain types of light boxes, certain types of diets and exercise programs, meditation, many things, certain types of therapy. I've tried to be as specific and useful as possible uh, because I myself have read health self-help books that are vague. And I didn't want to be vague. I wanted to be as clear as possible. But back to your question of cross-cultural uh, ideas, I think, yes, absolutely. You know, if you which which people are most vulnerable, which people are least, and a lot, most of us are just, you know, jumbles of genes of different kinds of cultures and different kinds of people. So um, I think that we should be um, alert to the seasonal pattern, no matter what our skin color is, our gender is, our sexuality and everything, because it doesn't discriminate. It, it can affect anybody uh, to a greater or lesser extent. So that would be my thought about that. Now you strike me as an individual who would also be open to someone taking what we talked about, reading the details from your book, and then trying to expand on it and trying to bring more uh, help to people. So I think it's one of those where, yes, you are the pioneer and you will always be the Jeopardy answer to who coined the term seasonal affective disorder. But I think um, one of the best parts about this, types of this type of conversation and the fact that your book is going to be out later this year is that someone can take the next step in, in the evolution of addressing these symptoms um, and helping as many people as possible. I would love that. I would love that. I have no illusions that anything I've done is the last word on a subject. I think it's an ongoing story and an ongoing journey. I invite colleagues to join me on that journey and join other scientists in finding out and discovering things that can make our lives happier and better. And if I'm even a little part of that, then I will feel very grateful and rewarded for any efforts that I have done. If you were me and preparing for this conversation, what would you have asked yourself that I missed or that more people should know? You know, I think you've been very open and I think that you've touched upon so many helpful things. You can't cover a whole book in a podcast, but I think to the extent that one can, there's actually nothing that I could think of. Sad can be serious. Um, it can threaten your life, but it doesn't have to. Sad can be moderate, but that could still be a serious pain in the neck because who wants to be moderate when you can be excellent? Sad can be minor, but still, we all want to do the best we can. We, we don't just want to be there in the room. We want to shine. We want to glow. We want to be incandescent. And that's what I would aim for, not just being, um, you know, run of the mill. Well, we'll leave it at that. I want to say, Dr. Norman Rosenthal, it was a real pleasure. And really, I'm super grateful for this opportunity to meet you, to, to read the book. Again, Defeating Sad, A Guide to Health and Happiness Through All Seasons is expected to be released in the middle of August uh, 2023. You can pre-order it now. Um, but again, I simply want to say thank you for sharing space, your insights, uh, and your time with us. Oh, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for having me as a guest.